Welcome to the A to Z of Baldur's Gate 3. I'm going to go through every letter of the alphabet and then give a word that or term for that letter. I'm only going to go through one term per letter because otherwise I'll be here for a very long time. And also if you guys like this type of video, I can then create more of them. So A, my A is going to be abilities or ability score, whatever you want to call it. Being strength, dexterity, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma. To add character creation, you get to choose a value for each ability score. And you'll notice next to the value is a uh, number, plus two, plus two, plus two, minus one, plus one or zero. These are bonuses to any sort of check or saving throw that you use these ability points. These are very, very important. If you have a low constitution, for example, you can't expect to have much health. I would say that if you, when you choose a different class, you'll see there's a little star that bounces around. This is usually the primary stat ability that you want for that class, if you want that class to be good. You don't have to strictly follow it, I'm not going to go through each and every ability. Some of those might be coming up later. What else could be before, if not Baldur's Gate, the titular city? So Baldur's Gate, there's loads of information out there. This is the Forgotten Realms wiki. I'm not going to go through all of it. It's way too much. But Baldur's Gate is presumably where we're going to end up at some point. It's a large city, metropolis. It's very dynamic. There's a lot of different races there. And it's a big city. So, I mean, you have the good and the bad. It was created and founded by a an adventurer, not called Boulder, but called Boldoran, or maybe Bold, Boulderan. I, I'm not actually sure how to pronounce his name properly. Um, he was an adventurer, he was very rich, gave some money to some people, and then went away, never to be seen again. And it kind of builds up around there. There's some walls, lots of different sections. If I come down here, all the way down, there's like an interactive map here. We've got the high upper city and the lower city and the outer city sprawling all the way down to here. There's lots and lots happening inside Baldur's Gate. Uh, Baal, the god of murder, has been involved in the city, and that's kind of what the previous two games were about. The most interesting facts I know is actually just up here. The city's law forbade animals bigger than a peacock to gain entrance. And so uh, apparently, in the, just outside the city, outside the walls, there have been some peacock breeders breeding the largest peacocks they can, so you can bring in animals as large as a peacock. C is for cantrip. These are magical spells that do not use spell slots and can be cast at will, meaning you can cast these as many times as you want in a day. There's absolutely no limit. I can throw firebots around. As long as I'm not hitting anything, these the I won't get upset. And if you click on this bit, you can see all of the this little square here. You can see all of the cantrips you can cast, which are generally picked at character creation. There are some items, some races give you cantrips. At level 4, a lot of spellcasting classes get to pick an extra cantrip and so on. And different classes get different numbers of cantrips they can learn. D is for dual wielding. I've got a star in here with two daggers. And there is a little toggle, toggle dual wielding. Automatically this is turned on, so if I attack, it would actually take both my action and bonus action. It would attack with both weapons. If you want to do it separately, click on the toggle or press R as a shortcut. We can attack. And then we've got this offhand attack for dual wielding. Now to be able to dual wield, you need two weapons, which are light, have the light property. And daggers are such weapons. There are some weapons that can't be dual wielded, even if you can put them in your offhands. There is a special feat that allows you to dual wield any two one-handed weapons, but there are some weapons even with that you can't dual wield. E is for early access, which is what we're currently in. Which means, for example, we've got a maximum level 5, which was level 4 until patch 9. We've only got a limited number of areas we can go to, Grimforge being the last area. We don't even have all the classes and races. And the game will finally be coming out on August 31st, although if you've got the Digital Deluxe Edition, it comes out on, or you can start playing on August 28th. Also there are bugs, such as, I don't know if it will show it here, but coming up and down ladders, for example, can be good, it can be bad, mostly. Well, that one worked out, but sometimes your characters go up and down the ladders for a long time. Hopefully, the bugs will be mostly taken care of before final release, but I don't think any game is released without some bug or other. F, this is a little bit cheesing, really, but F is for F5. F5, let's press it. Saving. It's your quick save button. Use it liberally. You've jumped. Press F5. You've attacked something. <laughs> Press F5. Please don't be one of these people who comes to the internet to complain. Oh, something went wrong. And I have my last save was three hours ago. Honestly, 
the end of the day, you've only got yourself to blame, if I'm honest. Because even if you don't press F5, you can come press save game. And linked to that, F8, I suppose. Quick load. Some of you will call it, oh, save scumming. That's up to you. Well, it's a single player game. Do what you want. But I would suggest you press F5 very, very often. G is for Gith Yankee. And if you do pick a Gith Yankee, you get intelligence plus one, strength plus two, and proficiency in light and medium armor, and short swords, long swords, and great swords. Quite cool, actually. Lots of good proficiencies there. We also get a mage hand, which is invisible. At level three, you get jump, the jump spell, and at level five, you get misty step. Pretty cool, pretty cool race. We also see Gith Yankee here in the opening cutscene, riding red dragons gifted to them by Tiamat. Uh, generally, they're quite mean buggers, to be honest. H is for Halsin, or should it be D for Daddy Halsin? He is a leader of the Druid Grove. He's been stolen. It is possible to save him. I won't give any away any more than that. But he is a great help, and he will probably be quite important in the future. So do be on the lookout for him. It's up to you. You can just outright kill him if you want. But I would not suggest that, in my own personal opinion. I is for initiative. We can't see the roll, sadly, but what is it? Well, initiative affects what spot you'll be in when the turn order of combat is calculated. The higher your initiative bonus is, the more likely you are to go earlier in the combat. And currently, the only way to affect initiative is with having a higher dexterity score. So your dexterity bonus is equal to your initiative bonus. Or the other way around, I suppose you could say. So dexterity here is plus two to ability checks. And if we go to detailed view, we can see initiative is plus two. If we get into a combat, we can see initiative rolls right here, right? It's a d20 plus the initiative bonus, but we don't see it down here. Halson happened to roll very well. In fact, my whole team rolled very well. Much better than all of the goblins here. So then we get to go first. These goblins basically don't stand a chance. So I have been asked in the past about initiative and bards because in 5th edition, initiative is uh, a skill check. So Jack of all trades applies to initiative. But I want to point out that it doesn't apply in Baldur's Gate 3. This is a bard who has an initiative bonus of plus two. The dexterity is 14, so it's just plus two from there. J. J is for jump. Now, I'm not talking about a spell. There is a spell called, literally called jump. I'm talking about the bonus action jump. So, it costs 10 feet of movement speed and a bonus action to jump during your turn. And the distance you can jump is dependent on your strength. So, Will here, with a strength of nine, quite low, gets a jump distance of 15 feet. Bear in mind, it only costs 10 feet of movement to jump so if you even with the weakest characters jumping gains you five feet of movement speed in during the turn if you don't have anything else to use your bonus action for if i pick someone with a higher strength let's have a go on over here with a strength of 14 jumps 22 feet a little bit further which is pretty cool k is for Korga, the current leader of the druids grove since master halson is missing she seems a bit stern, to be honest. She's the one who is initiating the Rite of Thorns. I don't want to say too much because it could spoil some of the story, but you will have to deal with her one way or another. L is for Long Rest. So if you want to replenish your spell slots, your health, and any other resources or abilities that can be cast once per Long Rest, such as this Drown Magic Fairy Fire here, you can Long Rest. And currently, you need 40 camp supplies to Long Rest. And during long rests is when you get cutscenes, is when people want to speak to you. And you know what, you can long rest quite a lot. We do need supplies, as mentioned, but there are so many supplies around. Look at this, I need 40. We've got supply packs which give 40 automatically, you can pick up food. You can send camp supplies to your camp chest, but if you want to then use them for a long rest, you have to go and take them out of your chest again. I'm kind of going to do M and N at the same time. My M, which could also have been I. M is for Mind Flayer. There we are in the background there. They are the people who have stolen us, put a tap hole on our brain, and are currently fighting off devils in Avernus. And the Gift Yankee attacked their N, their Nautiloid, which is where we start the game, which we also saw in the opening cutscene. And there's a poor Mind Flayer being chopped to bits by some imps, which also could have been I, I suppose. Nice little blast there. O is for opportunity attack. I'm going to show that enemies do it first. So if you get within melee range of an enemy and then walk out of melee range, they'll get a free attack or use a reaction, but they get an attack. You can see if you're going to take an opportunity attack by the arrows beneath the models. So if I walk to here, this goblin's going to take an attack. They missed, which is nice. 
And if I walk past this goblin and walk away from them, they get an attack also. This time they hit. For yourself, you can turn this on and off. Attack of opportunity. To have an opportunity attack, the enemy must start or go through melee range and out of melee range. And you must be wielding a melee weapon. So do make sure at the end of your turn, you have a melee weapon equipped. P is for proficiency. So at character creation level 1, our proficiency bonus is plus 2. What does this mean? A bonus added to attack rolls, ability checks if you are proficient with a weapon, tool or skill. You do also get saving throw proficiency, which adds a bonus to your saving throws. I'll cover the saving throws later. So for skills, we get to pick a few skills at character creation based on our class, sometimes race. This is a bard. They get proficiency or can choose proficiency from any, any of the skills in fact. But if I change to something like a barbarian, we've got a very limited number. Also, when we create or pick a class, it does tell us what weapons and armors we are proficient with. I do want to point out, shields have a different proficiency to armor. And if you are a spellcaster, if you don't have proficiency in that armor, you cannot cast spells. If you're trying to attack with a weapon you don't have proficiency with, you don't get your proficiency bonus added. And if also, if you are wearing armor you're not proficient with, you have disadvantage on attack rolls also. So it's really important you have proficiency with whatever type of armor you are using. Going back to skills for a second, and also this applies to attack rolls and saving throws. It says plus two at, at level one. At level five, this goes up to plus three. There are other ways to increase proficiency bonus, such as expertise, but that's not under P for proficiency. Q is for quest, and to open up your quest, you have to press J for journal, the quest journal. So here, this keeps track of what you've done, what you've completed, what you need to do, some tips and clues. But do look in the journal if you're not sure what to do. So for example here, we defeated the Wegar. Glut is pleased. I have to return to Glut to avenge Glut's circle. I don't want to go over too much because I guess there could be spoilers in here for those of you who haven't gone through this. But yeah, do keep an eye on this. Also, there are other tabs to go to here. Ah, R is for race. So we get these nine choices, and some of them have sub races. In fact, most do. Githyanki don't, humans don't, but otherwise, every other type of race has a sub race. And depending on your race and sub race choice, you get different features. So, for example, the high off here gets proficiency in perception, brilliant, and then proficiency in these in these weapons. We get an extra plus two to dexterity and dark vision and fey ancestry, and it gets to pick a cantrip. That's all good. When you're creating your character, do go and look through what features and bonuses you get because maybe you don't want to pick a gnome because you feel like you want to be a Githyanki because you want all the strength. Also in some dialogue options, not very many, but some dialogue options, you do get the tag, you get an option based on your race. S is for saving throw, which usually applies to spells. It can apply to things such as grease, which are on the floor, which don't have to be caused by a spell, can be caused by a grease bottle. Anyway, what are they? Saving throws are throws characters need to make to resist either some damage, such as from Cool Lightning, it says deck save here, or maybe an effect. So I'm going to show you this, so com command here, it says a wisdom save, so if they fail their wisdom save they will do what I tell them to, so let's say drop. It's going to affect three of them. They all pass their saving throws, annoyingly, so the saving throw DC is Set by the person who's casting, they happen to roll really quite well. A 16, a 20, and a 17. So because they pass their saving throws against the spell commands, they don't drop their weapons, and it tells us what ability score it targets, so wisdom saving throw. We're going to try the druid now, which is a deck save. This time, this isn't to resist the spell entirely. On save, targets still take half damage. Awesome. Cool lightning all the way down here in the underdark. Boom. Look at that, right, doing loads of damage. Tav, tears for Tav, we are Tav. So on in online discussions, the name Tav, word Tav gets thrown around quite a lot. And this is because it's the default name for our character since we can't pick any other origin, any other character. So you, you are Tav, we are Tav. Every now and again, I see the question, what is Tav short for? What does it come up? Why, why is it Tav? The story goes that one of the developers had a dog called Gustav and basically that's where this name Tav comes from. So if anyone talks about their Tav on the subreddit for Baldur's Gate 3, there's Tav Tuesday. This means your character. U is for Underdark, which is where you should find yourself during the course of the game. 
And it's essentially a very, very deep underground set of caverns spreading across the whole world, which is where we find drow, mind flares live down here, we'll find beholders. It's a very dangerous place to be. In the lore and canon, I think really it's probably supposed to be much darker than this, but obviously we're playing a video game. We want to be able to see. It would be absolutely annoying if we <laughs> couldn't see anywhere. But it is important to have dark vision down here or some source of light to help you during fights. B is for Volo. Our bumbling but People may think he's a bard, but canonically he is a wizard. Anyway, he's a bit of comic relief in a sense. He's a bit of an idiot. Somehow, still alive. Seems to be one of the luckiest people around. Is uh, kind of a buddy, a friend of Elminster. He's written a guide to monsters. He's going around documenting the world, I suppose. I know he does play a little bit in the story. No spoilers, but don't miss him. Do speak to him. W is for Wisdom. So it's one of the six ability scores and it affects five skills and I'm handling Insight, Medicine, Perception and Survival. It is also the primary casting stat or the only casting stat for Clerics, Druids and Rangers. I would suggest that Wisdom is a good stat not to dump, not to have low because Wisdom, as we saw earlier for saving throw, affects important saving throws that often control your character. So it's generally a good idea not to have a low Wisdom because having a higher Wisdom will make your saving throws better. Down to X, one of the harder letters. Thankfully there is a magical item which is dropped by Night Warden Minthara called Zionide, starting with an X. Thank you very much. Zionide's fire. Once per short rest, when the wielder misses an attack with his weapon, the target is encased in fairy fire, which gives you advantage against him when they light up. During the patches, this has kind of been nerfed. It used to be a bit better, where every time you missed, there was a chance an enemy would be encased in fairy fire, but now it's just once per short rest when you do miss. It's just 1d6 damage, one handed. Not the best weapon, to be honest. Usually there's a better pick. But hey ho, I don't have much of a choice for X. Next is Y, and it's Almost as hard to find a Y as there is an X. There's a few basically characters around. I'm gonna this Y is gonna be Yondala. She is the deity basically of halflings. She is the mother of the halfling pantheon, and according to the Forgotten Realms wiki, she's also kind of the matriarch of the whole race itself. And she scorns certain evil deities, according to the Forgotten Realms wiki, such as Bane and Cyric, who might actually turn up in Baldur's Gate 3. And she's generally a lawful she's a lawful goods gods. And she was an example to all halflings who Almost all of them share her curiosity, loyalty, and sense of mischief. Again, I'm almost reading verbatim from Forgotten Realms Wiki there. And Zed. Zed is for Zevlor. Kind of the de facto leader of the tieflings in the Dreadgrove. He doesn't like Korga. Doesn't like Aradim. But he's trying to save the tieflings as best he can. So let me know what you thought of this A to Z, or A to Z if you will. Let me know if you want to have another one of these. What what terms would you have included? There's so many that I could have included. Some letters are much harder than others, but I, I try to get the more general ones. Anyway, thank you for watching. Thank you to all the supporters of my channel, those of you who are members, and all of those who, lose, who leave comments. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing, and hopefully I'll catch you in the next one.